Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Tim Rambles on About Wine. Um, this is uh, volatile acidity is what we want to talk about. The good, the bad, and the ugly, um, because it has good parts about it. There can be bad parts about it, and it can also be ugly. So what we want to talk about is what is VA? What is volatile acidity? Where does it come from? What creates it? What's the effect on wine? And then we're going to talk about uh, there's going to be some physical and sensorial, uh, sensorial uh, aspects to it. Then we're going to talk about uh, managing VA from a hazard analysis, uh, critical control point uh, standpoint. But I think most importantly, we're going to roll into some case studies because I think that just tells you a whole lot more than me talking about what this thing is. So the reality is it all starts with acetic acid. What are the causes? So high sugar fermentations can be one thing. Yeast can create it. Certain types of malolactic bacteria can create it and also certain types of acetic acid bacteria can create it. So I'm gonna go through and we'll talk about what those are, um, but let's talk about acetic acid. So acetic acid is the base of uh, volatile acidity. So what, if we were to talk about, are these levels reasonably in wine? And this is a chart that I think would be uh, reasonably correct. Um, and so uh, obviously there's some, some changes um, here, but these are some numbers that we've had over the years uh, looking at uh, quality levels in wine. So let's talk about the low levels. Let's go through Riesling uh, would be really low. Um, we've had none detectable in some Rieslings we've had over the year. Um, non uh, malolactic fermentation uh, Chardonnays can be really low. Um, when we get into reds, we'll start to see a little bit higher volatile acidities. And the reason why we see that is in all red wines go through malolactic fermentation generally. And as a function of doing ML, you're always going to have a slightly elevated uh, volatile acidity. So these are numbers that we've had on uh, wines that I've actually measured. So if you wanna approach me, I don't wanna talk about them in presentations, I can tell you what ones they are. But the one thing you'll wanna notice is the really low VAs all come from really inexpensive wines. Um, if you push them through the pipeline really quickly and cleanly, uh, you co-inoculate, you don't stick the ferment, you keep your alcohols in line, um, the, uh, the levels will be quite a bit lower. So as you go through, um, low VA wines sometimes are actually associated with, uh, I wouldn't say lower quality necessarily, but um, they can be associated with, uh, you know, a, a more approachable style that's pushed through a pipeline in a very quick way. So um, VA is actually something that if we get a little bit more in it, uh, it can be a beneficial thing. So the way I like to think of volatile acidity is I like to quote Periclesius, uh, tis not the compound, but the dosage that causes something to be a poison. So uh, a little bit of it is, uh, if there's none in it, the wine's boring. If there's too much, it becomes faulty and bad. So what's the question? What are the normal levels? So here's some uh, outline numbers for you later on in your career to look at. But then the high ones are ones that we've uh, measured, and these are ones that we looked at. So I've seen a high one uh, uh, of Riesling get 1.5 grams a liter, and this was a, a Trockenbaum Ashlesa, uh, which is a, a dried, great, berry, moldy wine. Uh, Chardonnay at 1.2, which was a really high scored uh, Chardonnay that obviously had had some sort of stuck fermentation and had gone through uh, mallow, but it was uh, really rich, had a lot of leaves, had a lot of oak, and it was just really dense and complex. So it was a high score. Uh, the highest uh, Pinot Noir I've ever seen was a natural producer that probably didn't measure it. Um, again, Merlot was a, what I call an unnatural producer, which was just a mistake. I saw a cab sob that I just smelled, smelled like vinegar, and I measured it. It was 3.4 uh, grams per liter. And again, another wine really that I'm pretty sure uh, didn't measure. And we'll talk about what those things are. And we've seen Syrahs well over uh, the legal limit. So what, what is the legal limit? Um, and uh, we'll also talk about dessert wine specifically in the case studies. So uh, what are the limits? Well, there are limits in wine. And why are there limits in wine? Well, primarily it's a qualitative measure. It's really that simple. Uh, back in the day, they decided that quality wine producers didn't have that much bottle acidity in wine. Now, should there be a legal limit? Well, I would say probably not from a health perspective because it doesn't really hurt you because if it was a problem, you wouldn't drink vinegar. And vinegar at 6% vinegar is 60 grams per liter, which is well north of, of anything we're talking about here. So there's no deleterious health effects. Um, but the reason we have uh, limits on the wines is strictly a qualitative issue that I think came down as a result of some uh, you know, bureaucratic folks. 
uh, deciding what limits need to be there. Uh, it's something we like to talk about a whole lot, but um, the reality is I haven't ever heard of a winery getting busted uh, by the Tax Trade Bureau for having excessive VA. I'm sure it probably has happened, but it hasn't ever come across my plate. Okay, wait a second. Now I wanna get you out your two samples and uh, smell these, these wines. So one wine is illegal and one isn't. And I want you to try and guess which one is legal and which one isn't. So give them a taste, go ahead and pause the video for a second and then formulate your opinion and then decide which one you think is at the legal limit and which one's over the legal limit. Well, now that you've paused the video and we're back again, the one that tastes like normal wine is actually illegal. Uh, that has volatile acidity of 1.5 grams a liter, but it's all acetic acid. I added pure acetic acid to take that up to a, a volatile acidity of 1.5 grams a liter. The one that smells like fingernail polish remover, it's like smells like airplane glue that you'd think would be illegal, is technically legal because I dosed that directly with a compound called ethyl acetate. So what's important to recall is, or to note, is that uh, there's a difference between how you uh, sense acetic acid and ethyl acetate. So how do, we, how do we get there and what happens and what are the drivers behind that? So ethyl acetate. Um, basically what it happens is it forms from uh, ethanol turning into uh, binding up with uh, acetic acid. So ethanol and acetic acid become friends, uh, usually driven enzymatically or chemically, but this process is called esterification. So chemically it happens pretty slow and you might note that wines that are a little bit older have a little bit more of that aroma. That's just the volatile acidity in the wine esterifying over a long period of time. That's why older wines, they talk about decanting and blowing those aromas off because the ethyl acetate builds in wine over time. It can also happen enzymatically and the methods of enzymatically happening are driven by microbes. So uh, the microbes that have the enzymes to create this are ones that do it quickly. These are things that happen in ferment, they happen during barrel uh, aging, things like that. But these are the things that drive uh, that fingernail polish remover. Many winemakers want ethyl acetate to be the legal indicator of wine spoilage, but there's no real easy way to measure it yet. So um, I tend to think that ethyl acetate might be the legal indicator at some point in time once we can measure it easily. But for now, whenever we do uh, distillation or most of the enzymatic analysis that we do, we can't differentiate between ethyl acetate and acetic acid. So right now we just treat it all as volatile acidity. So this is what the esterification of acetic acid looks like for all of you people that like uh, chemistry diagrams. So the thing is about ethyl acetate, it's the dominant ester of wine. And you gotta remember some people just like to sniff glue. Just the way it is, it's how it goes. Um, I presented this at the Washington Wine Technical Group a few years ago, and I asked uh, anybody which sample they liked better, and about a quarter of the room really liked the ethyl acetate spiked wine. They thought that was what wine should smell like. And I also noted the age of most of those people that were raising their hands. And many of them are what I would call the old guard of Washington wine. These are people that are you know, definitely in the boomer category and they think this is how wine should smell. Uh, and so it's, it was very fascinating to me to see the people that really like that high tone uh, smell to the wine. I, I find it bothersome because it smells chemically, but some people are really interested in it. So if you're one of those people that smelled the ethyl acetate and was like, heck yeah, this is awesome. Well, congratulations. Uh, that's something you can look at in terms of making wine stylistically uh, that you, you'll like is go ahead and let your volatile acidities come up a little bit. Um, if you're like me, who's really bothered by it, uh, we probably make artificially low volatile acidity wines because I think it's one of those things that's really, uh, you know, if you control it, well, you can always learn to uncontrol it, just let things go. But I'd rather teach you how to make lower wines. So, but without some ethyl acetate, uh, wine is numb and sometimes lacks lift. And so the challenge is, is find a balance and keeping it from getting out of control. And so we'll talk about that. So how do we, you know, make ethyl acetate? What are the microbes involved in this process? Well, uh, here's the usual su suspects. Um, which we could, uh, you know, of course, uh, come in here and properly uh, cancel Kevin Spacey because he's not allowed anymore. But um, nonetheless, 
uh, this is dating me, I'm sure, but still nonetheless a great movie. Uh, but here's the usual suspects. So here's what you see uh, when you see grape must. And so this is what's coming in from the vineyard. And you see some nice berries, you see some sugar, and you're like, wow, that's, that's what you see on the big scale. Well, let's think about what microbes see. And so if you were to get out a microscope and look at that must that just came in with the, uh, with the grapes and everything else under a microscope, you might find some different characters. So starting clockwise from the top left, uh, we've got some Acetobacter. Uh, actually, that's Glucotobacter. Um, and that's a bacteria that grows on Botrytis wines. Uh, then moving to the right, the black and white picture, that is Acetobacter at a, under an electron microscope. And then if you take a look at the next one down, that's actually yeast. And yeast make quite a bit of VA. They're happy to do it. And that's uh, under our microscope at school. And then the next one over that are the rods, those are uh, lactobacillus bacteria. And these are different characters that can all produce VA if you're looking at them under a microscope. So that's what you see. But here's what they see. And the reality is inside of any fermentation is microbiological warfare. And so we've talked about this before. Yeast produce ethanol as a sterilant. If they can make enough ethanol, they'll kill off the bacteria. Well, guess what? The bacteria have a trick up their sleeve. If they can make enough ethyl acetate, enough acetic acid, they can poison the wine. They only have to get it up to about 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 grams a liter before it gets really difficult for yeast to ferment. Yeast do not like acetic acid, which is why you clean your drains, your cutting boards, and things like that with vinegar, because it's a good way of killing off microbes. So they see this as an opportunity to come in and have warfare. So let's talk about yeast first. Uh, yeast are one of our major producers of volatile acidity. We'll talk about what the drivers are behind them. So the two most common yeasts that make VA um, is Hansenia aspera uberum, um, and it internally creates ethyl acetate. So what's interesting about Hansenia aspera is that they are kind of a combo yeast. They do two things really, really well. They make alcohol, but they also make acetic acid at the same time, and they bind it together in their cells and make ethyl acetate. For anyone who did a native fermentation where they like shrink wrap the top and just left it, and you came and smelled it a couple days later and it blew your head off, that's Hansenia aspera in action. That's the native yeast in the vineyard, and they make quite a bit of ethyl acetate early on. The good news about ethyl acetate is it's very volatile, and in a very aggressive fermentation, it will actually blow off. It will leave uh, the fermenter. So one of the keys is if you do happen to get a wine that gets really fingernail polish remover in the beginning, it's important to get a yeast in there, a good Saccharomyces yeast, to get that uh, fermentation going pretty quick. But the other yeast that really does it too is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, just our good old fashioned wine yeast. Um, and the, the thing is, is that Saccharomyces really have a challenge once you get up above of about 23, 24 bricks, it's hard for Saccharomyces to do their job. It's really tough um, because they can't control the flow of sugar into their cell membrane. And when they're being force fed because the pressure of the sugar on the outside is just so great going into their cell membrane, they, when they can't eat on their own pace, they freak out and they make acetic acid. So osmotic stress, which is what we call it, just that osmotic pressure of so much sugar on the outside, pushing into the yeast, inside of the yeast cell, they'll take that, internalize it, and kick out acetic acid, which is a problem because that acetic acid is toxic to them and it'll lead to stuck fermentations later on, which is why we talk about watering back, getting our sugar contents right around that 24, maybe 25 bricks range, because as soon as we go over that, because a really difficult place for yeast to ferment. All right, so yeast are the first creators of acetic acid. Well, they're not the only characters. The other ones are malolactic bacteria. This one is a picture of lactobacillus. This is something you would see, which would be typically in yogurt, where it takes lactose, a sugar, and turns it into uh, lactic acid. So when you drink, something or you know drink like a, 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 a little one of those probiotic yogurts or just a yogurt and you know how it has that sour taste that's the lactose being converted to lactic acid well lactobacillus will do that in your wine too they'll take uh your sugar uh in your wine and convert it into lactic acid which will kind of give it a sour note um but the one that we typically use in winemaking is enococcus 
So Enococcus eni, this is what it looks like. It looks like a little rope uh, and underneath a microscope. Um, if you were to scale this up to like a yeast being next to it, the yeast would be bigger than your computer screen. So uh, Enococcus is quite small. It's hard to see under a regular microscope, but it looks like little tiny ropes under there. But again, it's another lactic acid bacteria. We also have Pediococcus, uh, which is another lactic acid bacteria. There's a whole lot of them, and lactic acid bacteria are just sort of everywhere around. Uh, Enococcus is the only one that we're supposed to use in winemaking, but Enococcus has advantages and disadvantages. And so we'll talk about uh, what those are and how they work. So um, let's talk about this. And the idea here is uh, homo fermenters and hetero fermenters. So homo fermentative bacteria, if you end a ferment, uh, they will take sugar at the end of ferment and they'll convert it into lactic acid. Hetero, hetero fermenters, will uh, take lactic acid and, or take, will take um, sugar and turn it into acetic acid, uh, maybe even ethanol, depending on the breed. But the point here is, is that when lactic acid get into your bacteria, get into your wine, they like to eat malic acid and convert it into lactic acid. That's their favorite food. But once that runs out, they will move on to other things. The other thing they'll move on to is citric acid. Then once they run out of citric acid, they'll start working on sugar. So they'll take sugar and mess with it. Now, what's important about this is, is that um, in the process of all this, at, at a certain pH, Enococcus will either make glucose into lactic acid, which will drop your pH and not create a lot of uh, acetic acid issues, but above a certain pH, uh, it'll go heterofermentative and make acetic acid. So why this is important is if you have a wine that's at, pH 3.6 or under, and you stick the ferment, you're probably going to be okay going through mallow because it goes through mallow, it finishes up, it's going to eat any of that sugar, that sugar is going to turn into um, probably mostly lactic acid, you won't get a big VA increase. On the other side, uh, if you're up above pH 3.6, which most of our wine in Washington is, you stick a ferment, uh, you're going to get a bunch of acetic acid uh, production. So why don't we use things like Pediococcus? Well, Pediococcus, are, they do other stuff. So the reason why we're not going to be using Pediococcus in our wine, even though it's a great uh, lactic acid bacteria, it's really good at degrading malic acid, it's really great at de degrading glucose down to lactic acid, but PDO does other things. And it really likes to chew up other amino acids and it likes to make all these other things called biogenic amines. We'll talk about them later. So Pediococcus may be really good at doing one thing, but it produces these things called amines like putrescine, cadaverine, tyramine, histamine, all that are really toxic to humans, which is why we don't like to have Pediococcus around. Lactobacillus, the reason why we don't use that in wine is it's not legal, even though I'm assure you that if you were to go run any wine in any cellar anywhere, you'd probably be able to find Lactobacillus eventually. But Enococcus is our lone legal um, thing that we can add. So Leuconostogonos or Enococcus, both the same name, just different uh, uh, terminology, is what we add. So when we're adding malolactic bacteria, that's what we're adding, different strains of, of that. And Depending on the pH, it'll either take glucose at the end and make it into lactic acid at low pH, but at high pH, uh, it will turn it into acetic acid. Um, again, here we are, same thing, but the idea here is just to take really good care and avoid and fix stuck fermentations. I'm going to take you through some case studies. I think this will really, really help. All right, so class of VA producer number one, yeast. Class of VA producer number two, is lactic acid bacteria. Class of uh, VA producing bacteria number three um, is gluconobacter uh, or acetic acid bacteria. So gluconobacter is one that's particularly nasty, tends to live on botrytis infected fruit. Um, and the other one is uh, acetic acid or acetobacter. Uh, this, is, this is the one that you will probably most commonly run into. Acetobacter is everywhere, it's ubiquitous. And the thing I will say over and over again, is the end product of all grape juice is to become vinegar. And over a long enough horizon, all wine will become vinegar if uninterrupted. So all winemakers are interventionist winemakers. We intervene. If we don't intervene, we make vinegar. And if you leave a barrel of wine, sit around for long enough, it will eventually become vinegar because acetobacter is everywhere. You have millions of cells on you right now that, that are living on you. They are in every cellar, anywhere, any place where there is sugar. I assure you, Acetobacter are around.
So just as a refresher, let's go through. We have three major classes of microbes that create acetic acid or create volatile acidity. We have yeast that do it. We have lactic acid bacteria that do it. And we have acetic acid bacteria that do it. These are the three categories of microbes that make volatile acidity. And you'll note that they all happen at a different time in the winemaking process, which is why it's really important for us to have some sort of hazard analysis and critical control points. This is a topic I'm gonna to bring back to you over and over again about volatile acidity. We have to have some sort of a HACCP plan. Where do we, in a production facility, decide when, what, and where do we manage volatile acidity? So let's go through some case studies and talk about that. So when is it important? Uh, so let's talk about pre and during fermentation. So what are the things that we can do in the wine before and during fermentation? First thing we can do is pH management. Lower pHs allow us to select for the microbes we want or the bugs we want. Another thing we can do is add sulfur dioxide at the crusher. Again, we're selecting for microbes we want. Why is SO2 so effective? SO2 is really good at whacking bacteria on the head. Bacteria don't like SO2. Yeast don't mind it a whole lot. It doesn't matter very much. So the first thing is, is SO2 will knock out uh, Glucotobacter, Acetobacter, and Malolactic bacteria right on the head, right at the crusher. We can do that early on, and then we can get yeast in the equation, get that ethanol content up, and then we have our bugs that we want at that point in time to take control. The other thing we can do is a quick inoculation. So if we're waiting for a long time, we're just taking our you know, grapes and crushing them up and waiting to see what happens, that warfare that I showed you in that previous slide is going on, it's happening. And you're just keeping your fingers crossed and hoping during your quote unquote cold soak that nothing bad is happening. And why cold soaks are really challenging is that uh, Hansinia aspera, which makes a lot of ethyl acetate, is cultured and lives in the vineyard. It lives outside. It's happy at cold temperatures. And if it's at 45, 50 degrees, it will happily sit there, cruise along, and make ethyl acetate for four or five days while you're sitting around waiting for your cold stoke to happen. Um, so keeping your cold soaks really cold is important um, if you're going to do a cold soak. Or if not, just inoculate quickly, and then you don't have to worry about it. Um, and whether that's through uh, a cultured yeast um, or uh, some sort of pied de couve where you know what's going on, uh, those are two things you can do to get that fermentation started quickly in order to have a, a high quality fermentation where we're creating ethanol as quickly as possible to knock out those other bugs. Um, and then we can also sort fruit. So if we have things that are moldy and gross, that's where there, there's plenty of bacteria already lurking in all those berries that are moldy and popped and have issues. So the thing is, is that we might want to sort really moldy stuff out because that can cause high levels and cause stuck fermentations. And again, once we get volatile acidity of a little, uh, little bit of a point, it can inhibit our Saccharomyces strains, which uh, might stick our ferments, which maybe we're going for. So we'll talk about instances where maybe that's something we're trying to do. So once we're into ferment, where do we, where are our critical control points? So the thing is, is the higher bricks fermentation will increase VA. This is due to osmotic stress. We've known about this for a long time. Um, so every uh, roughly uh, three bricks over 22, you'll pick up 0.1 grams a liter. So 25, you're gonna, so 22, you might be able to run a zero um, VA primary fermentation. As soon as you go to 25, you're gonna have a little bit more. 28, you're gonna have a little bit more. And the more that you, uh, you know, let your, your sugar contents come up, the more volatile acidity you're going to have. Uh, this will be really important when we talk about um, ice wines and, and high bricks ferments. Uh, nitrogen levels can also impact it. Too much nitrogen. So there are some places that have thousands of milligrams a liter of GAN. That is not Washington. And then uh, too little nitrogen can also cause uh, levels to be increased. The key here is to keep your yeast happy. Uh, fermentation temperatures. Uh, high fermentation temperatures, uh, anything above about 38 degrees centigrade or 100 Fahrenheit, can cause fermentations to stick. Also, the other thing is to talk about is co-inoculating. So if you're going to co-inoculate a ferment where you add malolactic at the same time you're doing primary, uh, you've got to be really careful because uh, even though the co-inoculation itself won't increase VA, 
if you happen to get a stuck fermentation where the yeast give up, you've got a raging malolactic fermentation that can come along and quite happily take your volatile cities and ramp them through the roof. So uh, the other thing too is, is to make sure that your primary fermentation is complete. And you're gonna hear me say this again and again and again. I walked into so many wineries that have VA problems and I asked them, what did they do to test for dryness? And they said they used a hydrometer and they actually had a stuck fermentation, but the hydrometer said that it was zero or below and they just thought it was done and walked away. And the next thing you know, there's plenty of malolactic bacteria quite happily around uh, to take that fermentation and crank the volatile acidity. I'll talk about some other things, but if you are measuring dryness with a hydrometer, you need help. There are other ways to do it. If you don't want to spend the money to do it with uh, a lab like ETS to measure for dryness, there are little clinitest tabs and there's other ways to check for residual you know, sugar dryness, enzymatics, other things like that that you can set up. And I recommend that you do that. Um, just using a hydrometer is, is not really the ideal way to do that. All right, after fermentation is done, we have to confirm our dryness. So if we're gonna take a wine through malolactic, we wanna make sure our glucose fructose is below one gram a liter for both reds and whites. We want it dry before ML completes. The other thing that happens is after we get it dry, after we get it sulfured, headspace is our enemy. No ullage tanks or barrels. I don't care if you gas it, it's always a problem. If you have to, you can gas with argon or CO2, but I promise you the number of wineries I've walked into that have had problems almost invariably have had ones where they just couldn't gas the tank enough to keep acetobacter from going. So uh, it's a big challenge. And then the other thing is make sure you're topping your burials, whether it's every other week or once a month, uh, but keeping those barrels topped is really, really important. One other thing I might add here post-fermentation is just keeping your cellar a little cooler. Um, the colder your, your cellar is, the harder it is for any of these microbes to grow. All right, let's do some case studies. So uh, this is our 2016 Riesling. Uh, this is from uh, Walla Walla Community College. Uh, and, uh, and the culprit is Saccharomyces. And so uh, the way I look at this is uh, nobody's perfect. So here we are. Here's our 2016 Lori. This is our juice panel coming in. And talk about glorious. I mean, it just doesn't get more glorious than this. It is a perfect perfect juice panel. You've got, you know, seven grams a liter of acid. Your potassium is nice and low. You're coming in right at enough to make 12% alcohol. You got plenty of yan. Everything is amazing. So we bring it in and we inoculate it. And then 18 days later, uh, well, 18 days actually, but you know, fair enough, you get the point. Uh, we get this and um, everything looks like it's going to be fine, except for take a look at this. Now, one gram a liter of volatile acidity. Now, this is an enormous issue if you are uh, making a light-bodied, fresh style of Riesling. Uh, one gram a liter of volatile acidity is a big problem. Uh, so what happened? We take a look at the scorpion and we're like, there's very little acetic acid bacteria, 9,600 cells per mil. You might think that's a lot, but in the micro world, that's nothing. That's virtually nothing. Lactobacillus, there's a couple around. Virtually nothing. Uh, Pediococcus, sure, there's some around, but virtually nothing. Um, we got plenty of Saccharomyces going on. So what the heck? Uh, we take a look at this and go, we, we scratched our head. We couldn't figure it out. Um, I talked to Rich DeCenzo. We thought there might be some Pichia Mabrafacians that was doing this. We ran the numbers again just to make sure we weren't nuts. And uh, no matter how we looked at it, we still had a gram a liter of, uh, of VA. So I have no proof to this, but I'm getting a little bit better at understanding this now. Um, I presented this particular presentation to the Washington Wine Technical Group uh, about 18 months ago. And uh, I got backed up in my theory by a major winemaker in Washington. So let's go through this. So here's our Cote de Blanc, which is our 16 Lori, and this is the yeast that we use. It's also known as Epernay 2. And so you heard me complain sometimes that we don't like to use this um, and that we ended up with a, a gram per liter of VA. Uh, here's another one where we had a student group that did absolutely everything right. Uh, this is going back uh, a number of years. So this is a few years ago where they did absolutely everything right. And their VA on their Riesling 
was 0.63 grams a liter, which was pretty high, whereas the one from the school that was on that year was totally clean. Um, and then we got this one, which is a really expensive, high quality Riesling from in town that also uses Cote de Blanc yeast. And their vault, I noticed when they smelled it, I was like, man, this is really vinegary. And sure enough, uh, 0.74 grams a liter of volatile acidity. Um, whereas uh, when we use QA23, here's a couple other ones that are kind of similar. And we, we tend to see these like non-existent volatile acidities, really, really low. And again, really, really low. Um, and so, you know, really, uh, what the heck is is causing it so i wanted to talk about this here too and um so um we go right here and this is the student group that used that same fruit that we used the student group in 2016 used uh, qa23 yeast and they had very low va compared to our one gram a liter up here with the coat de blanc so and I presented this, uh, a gentleman by the name of David Forsyth, who used to be the winemaker at Hogue. He also started Mercer Estates, and now he is the kind of kind of in retirement, but more or less runs Four Feathers. You know, he's produced probably more wine in Washington than just about anyone. Um, and he mentioned that they had to stop using Cote de Blanc yeast because randomly they would get these VA spikes. So the reason we don't use this yeast anymore is for whatever reason, something in Washington Riesling uh, can cause uh, high VA spikes. Uh, with with that particular yeast so uh, lesson learned which is why we don't use it a whole lot more. that being said we've had success with it other times but yeah uh, is it worth the gamble i don't know i'll leave that up to you so the question is how do we fix it uh this is a sweet spotter i'm hoping to show you how this works at some point in time um and we have one of these at the school we own one so what we do is uh this is a particularly unique nifty piece of uh equipment and what it does is it allows us to break the wine into pieces so on one half of the filter, uh, all the wine stays on one side, but this other stuff comes through called permeate. Permeate's totally clear. It's uh, really tight dialysis. This is, you know, about as tight as your kidneys are um, even, you know, and so the way this works is this filter splits the wine into pieces where only tiny, tiny things can fit through the osm osmotic side. And they're only things that are under 90 grams per mole. And so these are all really little things, but the things that can fit through uh, that number, it's actually 80 grams per mole, are acetic acid, ethanol, uh, a little bit of sulfur dioxide, and water. That's all that fits through. So acetic acid is the only acid that gets through. All the other acids uh, are too big. Uh, you know, uh, malic acids like 134, tartarics 150, lactics 90. So uh, only because the acetic acid gets through, we can take that, then we run it through an ion exchange column, and we can neutralize the acetic acid, and then we recombine the, the water and alcohol and everything back together again, and we can reduce the uh, reduce the acetic acid. So what did we do? We went ahead and took it, and we blended it with the 17 Sagemore Riesling, which had a really low VA or a non-existent VA, and then we added a little bit of juice reserve to it, and a little bit of muscat reserve to it. And this is what we ended up bottling, was something that came in uh, with uh, a volatile acidity of 0.49 grams a liter. So look at that. Beautiful, happy 0.49 grams a liter, which is high for a Riesling. But so what we did is we took a high VA wine, we ultra filtered it, removed the VA. Uh, we blended it a little bit with another wine to get our Columbia Valley Riesling, which isn't too crazy in, in volatile acidity. And then we blended a little bit of juice reserve into it to bring some sweetness to pop it. And uh, what did they say? Voila, the number top 100 best red wines by the Seattle Wine Awards, number six was our Riesling. And I just go, ah, okay, what the, our, uh, you know, throw your hands up and uh, scratch your head and go, wow, how about that? Um, bravo. So what's really happening here? Um, maybe we have a rogue Riesling yeast in the cellar. I think something in Washington Riesling causes Cote de Blanc to make VA. Reality is we don't know. But in the future, we're just going to continue to use more aggressive yeast to start our fermentations. Uh, that seems to be the best way to go because it's just not worth the risk. Our next case study. Uh, this is one where Saccharomyces, we know, is doing it. So talk about our 2013 ice wine. This is that idea of osmotic stress. So here's our ice wine coming in. And take a look at this glucose and fructose number. Whoa, dude. Awesome, hey? Um, and this is just a fabulous, fabulous juice panel for so many reasons. Um, I don't want to get too far off topic, but I think it's just a fabulous way to look at things. So first off, look at our acid. 
you add up our, our actual acid numbers here, we're at 14 grams a liter of acid with a pH of 417. Oh my gosh, that is completely ludicrous. Um, so how do you have 14 grams a liter of acid and a pH of 417? Look at all that potassium. This is a highly buffered, highly buffered juice. So you talk about buffer capacity, wow, this is it. But um, I think what's really important to look at is this is over 50% sugar. And so I sent this to Gordon, I asked him what he thought of it, and he said, oof, kaboodle, uh, which I thought was really fun. I'm gonna keep that in my, uh, my vernacular just for fun. And here's our finish line. Um, and, and take a look at that ball of city is uh, 1.19 grams a liter. Now I wanna point something out to you in this particular respect, is that um, what's, what's fascinating about this is that it took uh, three inoculations to get this through primary ferment, just to 10% alcohol. Uh, we had to ferment it three times. Uh, the first time we did it with a, a yeast called uh, Torlospora dubruckii, which is a candidia strain, and it doesn't suffer from osmotic stress. We pitched it in and it was able to bleed off the first, you know, 50 or 60 uh, grams per liter of sugar. The thing about Torlospora that's really interesting is, even though it's not very ethanol tolerant, it doesn't suffer from osmotic stress. It'll just ferment regardless of the sugar uh, content. So uh, it was able to bleed off that first little bit of sugar to lower the osmotic stress a little bit. Then we pitched it with EC1318. And then we followed it on again with a third inoculation of Uva from 43 to get it to 10% alcohol. It was a uh, somewhat of a miracle that we got it that high and it took uh, quite some time to get that ferment. And by the middle of uh, February, it just had given up the ghost. We weren't gonna be able to ferment it any further. And that's the idea about uh, ice wines is that they, they're they gonna give up. And when they give up, they're very stable because there's nothing left can live in there. The alcohol content's you know too high for anything. The sugar content's too high, but that high VA strictly came from that osmotic stress. So how do you fix it? You don't. This is typical of the style of wine. Um, however, this is the ultimate stuck ferment. Uh, and also you notice that total SO2 at 134 milligrams a liter is not gonna go through mallow. So uh, we make sure we get enough total sulfur dioxide in a, an ice wine and we don't have to worry about it going through a secondary ferment or, a, or malolactic. Anything over about 50 or 60 parts, it's not gonna go through mallow. And we'll talk about those uh, things when we talk about malolactic fermentation. All right, uh, here is another case study, uh, post-fermentation case study. Uh, this is a Napa Valley Cabernet Syrah. Um, this is acetic acid bacteria. This is a thing that came across my case. Uh, my, my, this is probably the first thing I was a part of a consulting winemaker cased on um, back uh, probably coming up on 15 years ago now. So I'm going to read this to you. Let me start by saying the 2005 Syrah tastes mighty good. When we bottle in March, it's going to be a crowd pleaser. The Cabernet is a different story. However, most of you are aware we were doing custom crush up to about three months ago in the Shenandoah Valley of Amador County. In January 2006, they notified us they would no longer be hosting independent winemakers and told us we'd have to vacate their winery. We did so in October 2006. We brought 54 full barrels of wine to our new facility in Lodi. Upon inspecting the wine after the move, we noticed a lot of barrels had not been maintained properly, was their charge, and upon tasting, we found all the wines had followed the city problem, most notably all of the Napa cabs. We did a lab testing, and we were stunned to see the level of VA in the wine. The Fraser Vineyard is at 0.38 grams per hundred meter. That's 3.8 grams per liter. Uh, and the Clone 6 was at 0.4, which is 4 grams per liter. And these uh, wines are totally unsalvageable. The legal limit of VA is 0.1, which isn't quite correct, but uh, you can see four times the legal limit. The wine can't be fixed. Um, so they rented a reverse osmosis uh, machine and were able to salvage some of the wines, uh, but now we're engaged in legal action. So here's my thing, is I'm looking at the time on this um, and, and you're thinking about all this and you're going, huh, what was our time frame? So in 2006, uh, they, they moved some barrels, 54 barrels to a new facility and just expected some other people were gonna take care of it. Um, I would actually tend to think, and I'm gonna bet you money on it because we look back at it, acetic acid very rarely gets up this high. I'm gonna bet these wines went to bed, uh, not sugar dry, and they went through mallow and spiked that way. This isn't an issue so much of uh, just an acetic acid bacteria. But um, my thought here is, you left your wine unchecked for 10 months. Well, isn't that a bummer? That's what happens. If you, who is gonna go throw 54 barrels of wine, Napa Valley Cabernet, which even at the bottom of the barrel is 50 bucks a bottle, which is $25,000 a barrel, 
which means we're talking about a million dollars worth of wine here. And you're just going to take a million dollar, your million dollar investment and go throw it in the back of the warehouse and just hope for the best. I mean, what the, anyway, um, uh, I'm sorry, but when you're negligent, I don't have much mercy for you. Anyway, it turned out not to be the custom crush facility's fault because they sent barrels that were half full. They had no analysis to prove anything. They had no proof of dryness at the end of ferment. They had no analysis or anything to, to give them legal standing. So the custom crush facility couldn't be proven guilty one way or the other. And uh, this company just lost a whole lot of money. And I think it all kind of culminated right around the time of the financial crash. Uh, so needless to say, most of these people learned that they shouldn't be making wine. So how do we manage acetic acid post-fermentation? SO2, yeah, if the barrels are topped, if the wine is dry and there's limited anaerobic bacteria. But SO2 doesn't help if it's an untopped barrel because the SO2 is in the wine. Acetic acid bacteria are on the wine. SO2 doesn't do anything. Um, and then there's another thing we talk about called lysozyme, which is really good at killing off other bacteria in the wine. It's good at killing off malolactic bacteria and other things like that, but it's not on the wine. Uh, so acetic acid grow on top. The only way you can control them, the only way, is by keeping the barrels topped and not allowing oxygen to be around. That's it. The other thing we can do is a cool cellar. However, uh, the bottom line is keeping your barrels and tanks full. Acetobacter needs oxygen to produce acetic acid. Using silicone buns is one of the most important reducers of VA. As a matter of fact, uh, in between the 1970s and 1980s, average VA went down by about uh, 0.5 grams liter in wine all across the world. And the primary reason was is we came up with silicone bungs. So keep your bung holes tight um, and uh, tightly sealed. And those silicone bungs really help a lot. Um, and then the other thing that really was worked on our end at the school is using high SO2 topping wine. So when we're topping our barrels, we're topping with between four and 700 part per million uh, uh, sulfur dioxide topping wine. And so uh, we basically nuke the top of the barrel with so much sulfur dioxide that nothing can live there. And as a result, we've seen the VAs at College Cellars. When I moved in, our average VA was about 1.2 grams a liter. And now our average VA is less, less than half of that. It's about 0.6. So um, just that high SO2 topping wine has been very, very helpful. It's a really easy way to make sure that your wine won't grow anything on it. Because the SO2 is, content is so high in the wine, no acetobacter, anything can grow on top. So SO2 doesn't really work at the levels that we have in wine, but once you get it up to 700 parts per million and there's SO2 gas floating off the top of the line, um, there's nothing going to grow in that. So it's really helpful to keep your topping wine safe and continue to top your wines uh, and, and killing off acetobacter when you, when you do top. It's been very, very helpful for us. All right, let's talk about another way to make high amounts of all acidity. So um, we've, we've talked about where yeast might make it, uh, and then we've talked about where, uh, so, so we have yeast with our, our Columbia Valley Riesling, which is a problem. We have yeast again with ice wine, and then we're talking about acetobacter and glucotobacter. So two of the three categories, but let's talk about our malolactic bacteria that can cause these problems. So here's a 2015 vintage, and I think this is a really, really good uh, thing to look at. And um, I want to point out that that 15 CL de Chevalo CDBB at the end with 0.72 uh, VA on it, uh, that's actually a fortified wine. So uh, we let it sit and let it rise on purpose. But uh, let's take a look at that one that's Grenache because something here makes us go, hmm, what is happening here? So I want to be really clear on this. Winemakers always say the same thing. Stock fermentations never happen to me. I ain't a problem. It's not my problem. And to that, I say bull pucky. Um, I have had stuck fermentations. I have worked with plenty of winemakers that have had stuck fermentations. And they all like to pretend it's just not happening. Like, if nobody sees it, it's not happening, right? It's not an issue because, you know, all winemakers are perfect and they just think they're amazing. And, and that's just not true. Sometimes things happen. And so what also amazes me about winemakers is they're the eternal optimists. They just think everything's going to magically work out. So let me take you through the stages of the optimist winemaker. Is that everything's going to be fine. Yeah, it's still fermenting. It's okay. 
Um, you know, the wine got a little stuck for a minute. It slowed down. It's sluggish. But I, I just, I just got a feeling it's going to be okay. Oh, look, the barrel's still bubbling. And I'm like, well, what's fermenting it? Oh, they don't know. And they're just like, it sounds good. It's, you know, I'm listening to it. The barrel's bubbling. You know, it's obviously fermenting fine, right? Sounds good to me. Uh, and then they smell the wine and it smells like vinegar and they go. So let's talk about stuck fermentations and what are the causes. Most of the time, it's high bricks. And I was uh, sitting on the toilet reading this when I had the struck of genius, and this was out of National Geographic. But <clears throat> what we do is we take a look here at death on the mountain. And what I like to do is think of this as like, uh, a, you know, high bricks ferments. So what I, the way I like to look at this is that in 18 bricks, um, there are no deaths on the mountain, right? Do you see how that the, these little triangles are the deaths on the mountains? 18 bricks, you never get a stuck ferment. At 21 bricks, you still probably don't get a, a stuck ferment. So we see here that there is a stuck ferment right here. And I think this is a pretty good analogy because yes, there's a stuck ferment. And this person that died here, he got in a fight with his Sherpa and died. If you stick a ferment at 21 bricks, it's your fault. Don't fight your Sherpa. Don't mess with your ferments. If you stick a 21 degree bricks ferment, that is your fault. Then once we get up around 25 bricks, look, we start having problems. And this is around 25,000 feet, very similar to 8,000 meters. And the reason I start to talk about this, this is where that osmotic stress issue starts to happen, where yeast really starts to struggle. And this is where we start to see stuck ferments. And we, we have issues at that 25 bricks. So once you're fermenting in this range, you're also looking at 14, 15% alcohol. It's a lot more challenging. You're going to have to be a lot more prepared to start doing these higher alcohol fermentations. And once we get up around 27 bricks, which is about 27,000 feet, this is when we run into stuck ferments. And when I see people have stuck fermentations, almost always, are somewhere between 25 and 27 bricks. Unless, of course, we're going for an ice wine, which is way up here at 30, but we're trying to stick it. So um, this is the danger zone. So uh, this is a really good one. That 2015 Grenache that has that high VA. This is the juice panel coming in. And we can see that we're sitting here at pretty high sugar. This is going to make a high alcohol wine. So here's our fermentation control chart. I thought this was really great because the students took, or actually it was Neil Johnston, uh, took a really good, uh, did a really good job of looking at this uh, fermentation. So he took really good records and look, boom, we hit negative about 0.1, not too far after, only seven or eight days later. And then boom, every day it's the same, negative 0.5. And I tasted the wine and I was like, this isn't dry. It's not dry. But notice something starts to happen here. Look, right about here, it starts to complete. And this is that Optimist winemaker stage because it's been stuck for five, six, seven days. And you're like, ah, it's okay. You know, I, I'm too busy doing other things. Um, and then all of a sudden, the, the, the bricks start to drop. And you're like, oh, phew, it's finishing. Ah, it's finishing. It's going to be fine. Well, what's the first thing that you should check when you have a stuck ferment? So I remember asking Neil about this, and I knew that where the sugar was, I was not particularly concerned, but it was important. So the first thing we want to check is we want to check our malic acid. So notice right around the time we had that sluggish point start out, um, we have a little bit of malic acid. And I noticed that on the 13th, we were totally malic dry because we had a live MLF culture. And so once malic's going, that means is going away. That's not yeast eating it. That is malactic bacteria. So we had a live uh, ML uh, bacteria culture, and it was rolling. And then we take a look, and again, we're, our Grenache here, our glucose and fructose are dropping. They're going down. All right. Our pH isn't changing a bit. And why this is important here is our pH may not be changing, it's staying flat. And why our pH isn't changing is because what's happening is sugar are converting acetic or uh, sugar into acetic acid. And acetic acid is a weak acid. And it's not very good at dropping pH. So even though our pH isn't changing, that doesn't mean anything in regards to volatile acidity because acetic acid won't move your pH at all. But while our pH hasn't changed, our TA is going up. So we're having an increase in titratable acidity. If our pH isn't changing, 
and our titratable acidity is going up. So some very simple tools that you have access to in any cellar. Just doing pH and TA, if all of a sudden at the end of ferment, you see your TA going up and your pH isn't changing, you're probably having an increase in volatile acidity. So what's happening? Whoopsie, there's our VA going right up. And that is uh, ML bacteria consuming the stuck ferment sugar that was left by the yeast uh, and making it into uh, volatile acidity. So how would you prevent this? Don't make a 15.5% alcohol Grenache. That's probably a first smart move. Maybe uh, water it back. Uh, shut down your malolactic acid bacteria. So if you got to this stage, you might want to throw a little bit of lysozyme and shut it down. Uh, the old school way is to add a small dose of SO2. 10 parts of SO2 is enough to knock uh, ML bacteria on the head. 10, 15 parts, shut it down, and then uh, come back in and re-inoculate with a really robust strain of yeast or rack it onto some fast lees from another wine. And then the other thing is we want to complete uh, our fermentation and restart if necessary. So what I like to do is if I ever have an opportunity, if I have a, like an, another wine, say we had pressed off the Petit Verdot or something along those lines and had quite a bit of lees, I'd like to take that Grenache and rack it onto something that's been alive for a month that's just finished and finished healthily. Because then you have a huge dose of yeast that are around and those yeasts are rocking and rolling and I'll be happy to help finish that wine. The other thing is, is that since those yeast are from another clean finished fermentation, those dead yeast are really good at detoxifying. They'll grab onto any of the bad stuff that's in that ferment and clean it out bad stuff like C6 and C8 fatty acids. They'll clean them up and then it'll help uh, finish off the ferment. Uh, if you need to restart, uh, then what you can do is, is buy uh, one of the restart companies' kits. Uh, Scott Labs make a restart. Uva Firm 43 is a really robust yeast. Something along those lines and go ahead and restart that fermentation. Alternatively, no that about 2.2 grams liter VA will be converted from each one gram of sugar. So if you have like five grams of sugar, you know you're gonna get about 0.2 grams liter, you're gonna pop by one, and if you're gonna blend it off, then so be it. Um, so in our case, what we did is we blended it off with a really low VA, low alcohol Morved, uh, low VA uh, Syrah, and then we made a nice 0.6 gram per liter uh, GSM. So those are some options you have. Um, but I want to point this out is stuck fermentations rarely happen at low grams a liter of RS, usually happen at 20 ish grams a liter. I'm going to show you some other examples of that to make this a little bit more clear. So this was one I was willing to let ride because it was a good opportunity for learning. And now we have a beautiful, uh, beautiful data set like this. All right. Another case study. This is a uh, SFCS before you think it's anything special that's stuck ferment caps off. Um, and this is a winery that brought me their wine and said, what, 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 what happened? You know, we, we don't know why my wine got a stuck ferment. And I said, well, let's run some numbers on it. And sure enough, we take a look at this and uh, they had added some SO2 to it at some point in time. Uh, and so obviously it wasn't going through primary. The pH is already really pretty high. The ML bacteria is gone and the glucose fructose is at 13.4 grams a liter, but it's already at 15% alcohol. So if this wine was to finish fermenting, for whatever reason, and, and realize this is in January of 15, this is on the 14 vintage. So we're already at that optimus stage, like times 10. And if it did finish fermenting, you can do the conversion, you're gonna get a whole nother, uh, you know, 1% alcohol. So we'd be looking at a 16.2 or 16.3% alcohol cab sob, which is pretty extraordinary. So we send it in and we take a look at it and uh, we got plenty of acetic acid bacteria because it's in an untopped tank. And we've also got a Achenococcus bacteria, and they are powering through this. Uh, this is going to be jamming the the, uh, the VA pretty high. So what I'm just saying here is uh, just do it, uh, but not tomorrow. Uh, this is something they should have dealt with earlier on. Uh, measuring their sugar on the front end, getting their alcohol down on the front end, uh, and taking it down below that 25 bricks to start with would have prevented this issue. Uh, this was a, a, a challenge that could have easily been pre prevented um, with a little bit more foresight up front. Here's some other ones that I'd like to point out that have come across my uh, plate. Um, and this one is uh, particularly interesting, but yeah, 3.1 uh, gram a liter of VA. And uh, here's another one uh, with a VA of 2.2 grams a liter, both the same winery. Um, and uh, same type of thing where there is no records of 
finishing fermentation. Um, the winery itself wanted to use less SO2, so they stopped using SO2 uh, to a degree. Um, they wanted to use no more than 35 parts, so they weren't adding any in the front end. Um, and they weren't also adding any nutrients. They didn't believe in adding nutrients. So the ferments were sticking and the malolactic bacteria were finishing it for them. Um, but the thing is, is I'm, I'm kind of looking at it here is both of the times they, they brought me these is it was already months, uh, months and months past when they had been making the wine. So this is me, you, know, you check for dryness, right? In June, and I'm like, ah! What are you doing? You know, I you gotta react a little bit. All right, so the ultimate case study. This is the one that still has me blown away to this day, and I have no rational explanation as to how this might have happened, but I am fascinated by a wine that could have ended up with 16 grams a liter of volatile acidity. Um, and I uh, labeled this one wow because wow, when I smelled it, that's all I could say. It smells like vinegar. Um, and uh, this was a wine that actually got rejected by a distiller because the distiller didn't know how to distill around that much volatile acidity. So fascinating stuff. Um, but what I like about this particular uh, wine here is that it has a 25 gram a liter of VA and it has 3.4 pH. And uh, this was a white wine to boot, which makes it even more fascinating. But the white wine, uh, when I looked at the juice panel when it came in, um, this had uh, a pH of around three, four anyway. So what was interesting about it is, is that this is, it illustrates what acetic acid is really good at doing. It's really good at adding to your TA. It's really good at impacting the sensory uh, aspect of your wine, but it's not very good at lowering pH. It's a very weak acid. Acetic acid is a very, very, very weak acid. And um, because of that, even though you're getting a big increase in TA, you are not going to be dropping your pH. So just remember that about this wine, but uh, about the way that acetic acid works. So this is a fascinating study in wine. Um, I don't know what happened, uh, but we'll talk about it. But all I can say to this one is, congratulations, you're the winner. I've never seen 16 grams a liter. I mean, I thought three or four was outrageous, but 16, you're a third of the weight of vinegar. Um, maybe they should have just kept going with it and uh, sold it as vinegar, made a little bit of extra money. So what would you do here? I probably watered back earlier on. Um, I would monitor my fermentation and given the yeast proper nutrition, don't withhold on that. Uh, I do know that the winery in particular was doing this, was trying to do it without any, any nutrient. Uh, they just wanted it to happen. Uh, they had no records, nothing was written down, zero. There was no uh, fermentation records. There was no yeast addition records. There was nothing. And also don't wait, don't bring this to me in June, wondering why your wine's goofed up when it should have been something that was dealt with in October. And that's it. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me um, and we'll, we'll go over this as needed. But that is the essence of volatile city. Cheers.